Hi, I'm Peter Mansbach, and I'm president of Circadian Sleep Disorders Network. I'm really glad for this opportunity to talk about circadian sleep disorders, including diagnosis and treatment. Let me start by saying I am not a medical doctor. I am here to raise awareness about circadian rhythm sleep disorders on behalf of those who suffer from these often debilitating disorders. I myself have delayed sleep phase syndrome. It is estimated that half a million Americans have delayed sleep phase syndrome and another 90,000 have non 24 hour sleep wake disorder. These are vastly underdiagnosed, in part because people are unaware of the disorders and their severity and their resistance to treatment is not widely understood. In this talk, I would like to particularly emphasize the need to take into account the patient's natural circadian cycle when evaluating patients in a sleep study. Let me start with some background. Many of you already know this. Circadian means approximately a day. Circadian rhythms are processes in living organisms which cycle daily. They are produced internally in all living things. They're also referred to as the body clock. Humans have internal cycles lasting on average about 24 hours and 10 minutes, although the length varies from person to person. Early experiments seem to show a cycle of about 25 hours, and this still gets quoted, but it's now known to be incorrect. It arose because those experiments allowed light exposure in the evening. While these internal rhythms are approximately 24 hours, they are adjusted daily by external factors called sight-gabers, especially sunlight or other bright lights. This synchronizing with the 24-hour day-night cycle is called entrainment. The most noticeable feature of the circadian rhythms is the sleep-wake cycle. But there are other rhythms, including swings in many hormones throughout the day, body temperature cycle, appetite, and the times of best alertness. Ideally, these rhythms are in sync with each other and with the light-dark cycle in nature. Most folks are awake during daylight hours and sleep during darkness. The master clock in the body is a small part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SCN, located in the hypothalamus. The SCN keeps the clocks within organs and individual cells in the body in sync. The master clock normally gets adjusted every day when a person is exposed to light. The receptors in the eye most effective in doing this are not the rods and cones we learned about in school that give us vision. They are cells called IPRGC cells, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, which are not involved in vision and were discovered not so long ago. The length of the internal circadian cycle can normally be a bit shorter or longer than 24 hours. In normal sleepers, the cycle is entrained to the day-night cycle by external factors, especially light. If it cannot be entrained, the result is a circadian disorder. So a circadian rhythm sleep disorder is an abnormality of the body's internal clock in which a person is unable to fall asleep at a normal evening bedtime, although he is able to sleep reasonably well at other times dictated by his internal rhythm. A person cannot fall asleep when desired, so he complains of insomnia. He has trouble waking up when desired, so he complains of excessive sleep, sleepiness. It takes some insight to make the connection that the problem may be with the timing of sleep rather than the sleep itself. Common to these disorders is inflexibility. Even when physically tired or sleep deprived, sufferers cannot make up for lost sleep outside of their hardwired sleep times. 
This factor is generally misunderstood by people who do not suffer from these disorders, leading to a conclusion that we are just lazy or that we haven't tried hard enough to live on society's schedule. Some people are flexible and can adjust to sleeping on practically any schedule. Still, they may prefer to wake up early, we would call them larks, or stay up late, night owls. But other people cannot adjust, and forcing themselves to be awake at the wrong time for their body can make them ill. They have a circadian rhythm sleep disorder. In addition to the sleep-wake cycle, the internal coordination of various other rhythms may also be faulty. For example, some hormones may be on a different daily cycle than others, and this lack of coordination between systems may produce other symptoms in addition to the sleep disorder. This is believed to be the cause of the discomfort of jet lag. The ICSD, International Sleep Classification of Sleep Disorders, lists six subtypes of circadian rhythm sleep disorder. We'll focus mainly on delayed sleep phase syndrome and non 24 hour sleep wake disorder. The ICSD lists these factors for diagnosing DSPS. Sleep onset and wake times that are intractably later than desired. Actual sleep onset times at nearly the same daily clock hour. Little or no reported difficulty in maintaining sleep once sleep has begun. Extreme difficulty in awakening at the desired time in the morning and a relatively severe to absolute inability to advance the sleep phase to earlier hours by enforcing conventional sleep and wake times. Delayed sleep phase syndrome, or delayed sleep phase disorder as it's now called, is a disorder in which a person's sleep occurs much later than desired. He finds it difficult to impossible to fall asleep until very late at night and therefore difficult to wake up until very late in the morning or even the afternoon. For example, a normal sleeper shown in the green line may sleep from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Someone whose sleep is delayed six hours, as an example, which we've shown as a red line, would be sleeping from 5 a.m to 1 p.m. This makes it impossible to hold a typical 9 to 5 job. If the person tried to hold the job anyway but couldn't fall asleep till 5 a.m., he would quickly become severely sleep deprived. Why not just go to bed earlier? There are two factors involved in DSPS, something people often overlook. One is that the body's clock is shifted later in the day. The other is that the person is unable to shift it earlier. He either cannot sleep at an earlier time at all, or his sleep at the earlier time is not restorative. It's similar with shift work. Some shift workers can adjust to working at night and sleeping during the day. Some have difficulty. Some cannot adjust at all. This is really hard for a person with normal sleep to understand. They can fall asleep when they're tired. They get tired when they're supposed to. They may have trouble getting up on time or they may feel tired during the day, but then they can get to sleep earlier the next night. We can't. It is really difficult for most people to understand what we're up against. Even the DSPS person, even if the DSPS person forces himself to get up early and then goes to bed early, he cannot sleep. It's like he's on internal caffeine. There are a number of biological markers that can be measured that cycle with the circadian rhythm. So we can objectively measure the timing of a person's circadian rhythm 
and confirm that there really is something going on with these disorders. Melatonin is a hormone produced by the body which is intimately involved with sleep. Its level normally rises about two hours before bedtime, called the dim light melatonin onset or DELMO. It's high during the night and falls toward morning. And again, we've shown normal sleep hours in the light blue in these charts. In people with DSPS, melatonin secretion is delayed or in some cases non-existent. Core body temperature is normally high during the day, drops around bedtime, reaches a minimum a few hours before awakening, and then rises again. Core body temperature is also delayed in people with DSPS. Cortisol level also follows a circadian rhythm as do several other hormones. How many people have DSPS and are not just evening types by preference? Based on a Norwegian study, 0.17% of adults have this disorder. That's well over one in a thousand, over half a million American adults. About three times as many people as have narcolepsy, which I've shown comparis by comparison at the bottom but we do need more data since most adults go undiagnosed. It's much more common in teens. At estimates of perhaps 10 to 7 to 10 percent of teens are common. That's around 2 million Americans. Most of them do grow out of it in their 20s. Let me tell you about some of my own experiences. In college, I had trouble getting up on time for class. My roommate, junior year, threatened to go to the dean because I kept snoozing my alarm seven, eight, nine times, he said. I was unaware that I was even doing that. But who knew about sleep disorders? A lot of people complained about having to get up in the morning, so I just forced myself to do so. I was young. That year, I had to take the earliest class of my college career. I had an hour between that class and the next, and I was so tired that I would lie down in the corridor outside the next classroom and nap. If you're tired enough, it doesn't matter how weird you look. I also started having migraines during that class, but didn't make the connection with the early rise time. I wouldn't be diagnosed until 16 years later. Even that was a stroke of luck. Back then, there weren't any sleep labs in the Washington, D.C. area where I lived. So I was referred to Montefiore Hospital Sleep Lab in New York. Quite by chance, at that time, the research team there was first elucidating delayed sleep phase syndrome. Their paper wouldn't be published for another year, but they recognized the disorder in me immediately. Since then, I've lived on my natural schedule, but I did lose my physics job and my career in research because of my hours. Fortunately, I could find contract work in computer programming, which I could do on a later schedule. My sleep time now is roughly 3 a.m. to noon. While I was living on society's schedule, I had two episodes of major depression and was always a bit down. Since I've lived on my body's preferred schedule, I've had no more episodes of depression and a pretty normal mood. I read letters from some of our members with DSPS. Here are some quotes. For decades, I worked day jobs, sleeping 3.30 to 7.30 a.m., catching up on weekends. That work as long as youthful resilience lasted. Next step was adding a nap, 5 to 10 p.m. Wreaks havoc with the social life, but it kept me my job for years. If you can't be normal, you're not good enough. You learn to apologize, make excuses, tell lies. No one understands. Another member writes, I just can't help thinking that I'd have no problem being awake and alert if I were follow my own natural sleep cycle. 
The only problems I would face are unemployment and no social life. Summarizing many of the other stories I've heard, so many bright people with career aspirations that were stopped in their tracks by their sleep disorders, people unable to get suitable accommodations at work, people who went for years being repeatedly misdiagnosed and often given medications with side effects for conditions they didn't have, so many unwarranted referrals to mental health professionals and mental health professionals who then treat it as a psychiatric disorder, and so much misunderstanding by society, even by the patient's own families. We're often told we could get up early if we wanted to. We show the doctor's articles on the web, research articles in the journals, but sometimes they refuse even to look at them. They just refer us to the psychiatrists. Let me touch on these other circadian disorders. Advanced sleep phase syndrome, or ASPS, is the opposite of delayed sleep phase syndrome. This is the purple line. People fall asleep early in the evening and wake up very early in the morning, perhaps 4 a.m. It's much rarer than DSPS, according to the Norwegian study. People who suffer from it get up early, get to work on time, and don't generally need to sleep until after normal work hours. So their lives are not disrupted as much compared with DSPS or non-24. I don't know much about irregular sleep-wake disorder, which is shown in the bottom line. It's very rare. It occurs mostly in people with severe brain dysfunction, and they sleep on an erratic schedule, as shown. Non-24-hour sleep-wake disorder, non-24 for short, is a disorder in which an individual falls asleep later and later each day eventually rotating all the way around the clock. Generally, the delay in sighted patients is about an hour or two each day, corresponding to a day that's 25 or 26 hours long, but it can be much longer. In blind patients, the delay is usually less. In either case, their body's preferred sleep times progress around the clock. It's also known as free-running disorder and hypernicthemoral syndrome. For example, let's suppose our subject goes to sleep today when she's tired at midnight and sleeps till 8 a.m. and is fine. This is the orange line. Tomorrow, she may not be tired enough to fall asleep until 2 in the morning, the green line, and so she'd need to sleep till 10. The next day, she can't fall asleep till 4 a.m. and sleeps till noon. So it progresses. A few days later, she'll be going to sleep at noon, and some days after that at 6 p.m. Her sleep progresses all the way around the clock, back to where it started, and keeps going like that. It's estimated that over half of all totally blind individuals suffer from non-24. That's about 90,000 Americans. This is not surprising, given that sighted people synchronize their slightly longer circadian rhythms to the 24-hour day through light exposure, and the totally blind aren't getting that light exposure through vision. Some do respond to light via the RP, IPRGC cells, which are separate from vision, but others do not. Non-24 is believed to be rare in sighted individuals, but even that is not known for certain. What is known is that it's rarely diagnosed, but I know of over 50 sighted individuals with non-24. I've added a line for non-24 to the previous slide. It's at the bottom. You can see it's much rarer than DSPS. Some non-24 folks, especially those unaware of the condition, 
force themselves to live on a 24-hour schedule. When their body's preferred sleep time coincides with the Earth's night, they sleep well and feel fine during the day. When their body's preferred sleep time falls during the daytime, they sleep poorly and suffer excessive daytime sleepiness. This makes their problem look like periods of insomnia with some good nights clustered together in between. So it's difficult to recognize the non-24 as such, and as a result, non-24 is almost certainly underdiagnosed. Other people go with the flow and sleep and wake as their body dictates. They are sometimes in sync with the day-night cycle, but their sleep progresses around the clock later and later each day. They find it impossible to hold a conventional job and difficult to have a social life. For some, the delay is regular. For example, they may shift an hour later each day. But for others, the delay varies up to several hours and they cannot predict their schedule at all. So it becomes difficult to schedule any appointments in advance. I read letters from our members with non-24 and it breaks my heart to hear their struggles. Many of these folks cannot find a job and have no money. Here are some quotes from different people. Ever since I became non-24, I constantly have to beg people to change their schedules or try to be pleasing and unobtrusive while I quietly ask if they have another time available. It has affected my relationships with all. Family who don't believe in it, friends who can never find a slot to talk to me, let alone get together, and have finally stopped trying. Doctors next to impossible to schedule. When I can't meet the world's demands, I am deemed selfish or weak or lazy or depressed. I could be fine with me, but the world is not fine with me, and that makes me not fine. I feel isolated. I am desperate for social contact. Another member writes, what is hardest is explaining non-24 to new acquaintances, for example, someone you might meet at a party. It tends to derail the whole social process. The inability to remain employed has an even more profound effect on my social life. It's not something people accept when you look healthy. What are the underlying causes of these disorders? I believe there are several different abnormalities that can cause both DSPS and non-24. These may include a long intrinsic circadian period, lack of sensitivity to light or oversensitivity to light, lack of melatonin production or long elimination time of melatonin, deficiencies in the light sensitive IPRGC cells of the retina, a long time from core temperature minimum to wake up time, differences in tolerance to phase mismatch. It's my belief that both DSPS and non-24 have similar underlying causes. They may differ in the degree of various factors and how they interact with the result that DSPS people can entrain to a 24 hour day, though not at the usual time, and non-24 people cannot. I also know of several people who used to have DSPS, but are now non-24. I would note that, anecdotally at least, younger people seem better able to maintain a required schedule despite their circadian disorder. As they get older, they may no longer be able to do that. So that might, may be what drives them to see a sleep specialist. How are these disorders diagnosed? Some patients will come in with a history of unusual sleep hours. Some may already have kept a sleep log and may even have charted their sleep times graphically if they've read about circadian disorders on the web. The charts are most valuable if they've been able to sleep on their body's preferred schedule. 
if they are forcing themselves to get up for a daytime job, it may be less informative. Here's an example of a sleep chart on a form that's been used by some sleep doctors. The time of day is marked across the top from 6 p.m. one day to 6 p.m. the next. Successive days are shown one below the next. Sleep periods are marked in dark gray. I've added an indication of normal sleep hours 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. in light blue. This would not normally be shown. This is two weeks of my own sleep that I recently recorded. So it's for a typical, though relatively mild, DSPS person. You can easily see the delayed sleep pattern. The chart shows a few naps as well. The second chart was recorded by one of our non-24 members. The first few days seem quite irregular, and that seems to happen. Starting around the fourth day, there's a clear progression around the clock. Remember that some of the sleep periods wrap around from one day to the next. Many doctors, if they suspect a circadian disorder, will ask their patient to wear an actigraph to monitor their actual sleep and wake times. An actigraph is a motion sensing device that's worn like a wristwatch. Again, this is most illuminating if the patient is sleeping on his own schedule. This slide is the actigraph recording of another member with non-24. The white areas are the sleep times. The dark ones mark represent activity. Many sleep doctors require a polysomnogram, PSG, at least to rule out other sleep issues such as sleep apnea or restless legs. The sleep study is most revealing when it occurs when the patient can actually sleep and sleep normally. Many of our members complain that their PSG was administered from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m and they were unable to sleep at all during that time. I myself went for a reevaluation 15 years after my original diagnosis. The doctor ordered a PSG, which was conducted from midnight to 5 a.m. The doctor concluded that my problem was that I wasn't getting any deep sleep and wanted to treat me accordingly. Not only were the hours unsuitable for my DSPS, there were other extenuating factors, such as a full-blown migraine headache. But the doctor insisted that the lab measurements never lie. A little humility, please. There's still so much we do not understand about sleep. Please listen to what the patient says. With non-24 people, the situation is even more complicated. Many non-24s can't predict their sleep times more than a few days in advance, but have to schedule the PSG weeks ahead. They don't know whether they will be able to sleep then or not. They don't know what to do and often report that the sleep doctor didn't even want to hear about the problem. Some doctors will hear the complaint of daytime sleepiness and refer the patient to get an MSLT, a multiple sleep latency test, to test for narcolepsy. Dr. Mignot and others have noted that workers on a night shift may test positive on an MSLT, even though they test normal when working on a daytime schedule. This is because their internal circadian rhythms are out of sync with respect to the hours they're trying to sleep. One might expect, therefore, that someone with DSPS forcing himself to live on a daytime schedule might also test positive on an MSLT since his rhythms are similarly out of sync. Many doctors are now aware of narcolepsy and many sleep doctors are able to recognize it. But so many are still unaware of DSPS or think it occurs only in teens unaware of non-24 or think it occurs only in blind folks. So they send the patient to, for an MSLT 
get the positive result, and diagnose narcolepsy. It seems possible that at least some people diagnosed with narcolepsy without cataplexy may in fact have delayed sleep phase disorder as their primary disorder. Certainly, the daytime sleepiness is similar if the DSPS patient is not sleeping on his own schedule. I mentioned earlier that melatonin and core body temperature follow a daily rhythm. This chart shows core body temperature, but what I say applies to other cycles as well. I've shown a normal temperature cycle in green. The blue area represents a normal sleep time on a normal sleep schedule, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. As you can see, the core body temperature is quite low during this period. In red, I've shown the same cycle shifted six hours later in time. This is what one would expect to see for a DSPS patient. But imagine the DSPS person trying to sleep till the, during the normal sleep time, the blue area. His body temperature is still high. His body is running full steam. Why not use these biological markers as a diagnostic tool? One reason is expense. Whichever marker is being measured has to be measured frequently over a 24-hour period. In the case of saliva melatonin, the patient needs to provide saliva samples over many hours, and each sample has to be analyzed. Nevertheless, this test has been done in some cases. Another reason is that it's easy to confound the results. Melatonin levels are affected by light exposure and activity, and even by food. Accessible body temperature, such as an oral measurement, is very much affected by eating as well as activity. It really requires a standardized laboratory environment to get meaningful results. How are DSPS and non-24 treated? As with all sleep problems, the first step is to assure that the patient understands and follows recommended sleep hygiene. Most of you have seen this, so I won't read it. For people with DSPS or non-24, this is generally not sufficient to normalize their schedule. Sleeping pills are often prescribed by GPs, but they are of little help. They may make you unconscious, but don't alter your circadian rhythm, and the resulting sleep is generally not as restorative. Since most people with DSPS find it difficult to move their schedule earlier, the original treatment called chronotherapy had patients moving their schedule later instead an hour later each day, all the way around the clock until they reached their desired wake-up time. Then they were supposed to stabilize at that desired time. Even when successful, this treatment had a high rate of relapse and has to be repeated frequently. But for some patients, their sleep times kept progressing, wouldn't stabilize. Their DSPS had become non-24, which was a much more disruptive disorder. So this could be a risky treatment. The most common treatment for circadian rhythm disorders is light exposure. It has been shown for normal sleep sleepers that light in the morning advances the rhythm, makes it earlier, whereas light in the evening delays it. So for both DSPS and non-24, the light must be used in the morning. We'll see in a moment why that has to be the patient's internal warning. The light has to be bright. The common recommendation is 10,000 lux for at least half an hour. That's very bright. Typical room lighting in a home runs between 50 and 100 lux. Sunlight is great, of course. There are also a number of light boxes made for this purpose. 
Treatment using light is based on the phase response curve, or PRC. This curve shows how much the circadian clock shifts in response to light exposure at different times of the day. I've shown a sample PRC and marked some points on it just to explain what it means. The red dot, for example, tells us that if the patient is exposed to bright light in awakening, his circadian cycle will shift about 15 minutes earlier. The green dot shows that exposure to the same light an hour before bedtime can shift the cycle two hours later. Various studies have determined PRCs. The actual values depend on the light intensity, duration, color, and prior exposure. But they are qualitatively similar. Light exposure early in the day advances the clock, moves it earlier. But light exposure late in the day delays it. During the night, the effect changes from a delay early in the night to an advance toward morning. The change occurs around the time of core body temperature minimum. Note that most of these studies were done on people with normal circadian rhythm. I also want to emphasize the individual variability. For example, the red dot in the previous slide in this one is the result of curve fitting primarily to data from four individuals shown inside the green oval. One of them showed a delay of about half an hour, one had no change, and two showed advances of about an hour. That's what gave rise to the average 15-minute advance. So please, don't expect your patient's response to lie right on the curve. So there's an often overlooked wrinkle in prescribing light therapy the patient's clock may initially be considerably delayed. Even if he's forcing himself up at 7 a.m. to get to his job, his internal time may have his body thinking that night is from 5 a.m. to 1 p.m., for example, with a temperature minimum at, say, 10 a.m. But if the doctor tells him to use the lights immediately on arising, he is using the lights before his temperature minimum when they will cause his schedule to be delayed further. Not what we want. There's little data on how to proceed. Some doctors and many of our members believe it is necessary to determine one's natural wake up time and to start by using the lights at that time. One can then move the lights earlier perhaps by 15 minutes every few days, until reaching the desired wake-up time. It may also be necessary to avoid light exposure before one's current temperature minimum, if one is getting up then for work. For non-24, of course, one can simply wait until the patient's internal schedule comes around and coincides with the desired schedule and then start the treatment to keep it from shifting earlier. Light treatment cannot start independently of the patient's current schedule. How fast to shift? There seems to be a lot of variation in how fast parents, patients are told to shift their schedule. Some of our members were told to shift immediately to their desired wake up time. Others were told to shift half an hour a day. Many of us believe from personal experience that shifting may occur even more slowly, and there is some research that supports that. Some people are helped by light therapy, others not so much. One study documents success rates of 42% for DSPS patients and 32% for non-24. Obviously, this depends on the details of the intervention. I'll talk more about this later. Recent research indicates that even low levels of light in the evening can delay the clock. In other words, it takes a really bright light in the morning to advance the clock, but only moderate light in the evening to delay it. Blue light has a particularly strong effect. It is thought 
the bluish light from TV, computers, and phones may be delaying the rhythms even of normal sleepers. So some patients are now trying to restrict light in the evening, including using blue blocking glasses, and have reported some success shifting their schedule this way. But there are no standards yet regarding how much light is tolerable, how early the restriction should start, and whether light without blue content is okay to use during dark time. Melatonin is also used to treat circadian rhythm disorders. Researchers have developed a phase response curve for melatonin, the heavy curve on this slide. Qualitatively, it's the opposite of the PRC for light. Melatonin in the morning delays the clock, in the evening it advances it. Melatonin has been used to treat circadian rhythm disorders in two ways which unfortunately get confused. Some people take it shortly before bedtime and it helps them fall asleep. This is indicated by the green dot. It does not shift their schedule. Others take it four to six hours before bedtime. Used in this way, it can help advance their rhythm. That's shown by the red dot. It can also make them sleepy too early. Melatonin seems especially useful for blind people since they don't have the option of using bright light in the morning. Several pharmaceutical companies have developed melatonin agonists as an alternative to melatonin itself. A new one has recently received FDA approval. There's evidence that the same dose of melatonin in different individuals results in as much as 35-fold variation in serum concentration. So the same pill in one person causes blood levels 35 times higher than in another person. Yet some doctors will attempt treatment with one dose and abandon melatonin treatment if that fails. One paper about a blind patient documents the failure of a three milligram dose, but success with half a milligram. The authors conjecture that this may be because too much melatonin remained in the patient's blood by morning, where it again delayed his body clock. We suspect that elimination times may vary among individuals as well. I've read the personal stories of many people with DSPS or non-24 who have tried for long periods of time and at great personal distress to follow their doctor's treatment prescriptions, but the treatment failed. It failed in that the patients complained of increasing tiredness, decreasing ability to function normally in their lives, even illness. In less severe cases, the reports were of lack of alertness, memory difficulties, or feelings of being dissociated from life. Why do treatments fail? Many research studies which conclude that the patient have reset their clocks measure DILMO and or CBT, but don't measure sleep quality, daytime performance, or subjective well-being. Some patients complain that they still don't feel rested after sleeping on the new schedule after treatment. For this reason, they may choose not to continue treatment. So the low compliance often cited in the literature may be due to this lack of subjective improvement. To put it bluntly, I don't care if my DILMO has shifted if my head is still in a fog all day. Research on shift work disorder in otherwise normal sleepers is often used as the basis for treating DSPS patients. But some DSPS patients may have underlying impairments, for example, insensitivity to the phase resetting effect of light, and that may make the research results inapplicable. There are other reasons as well. There can also be partial success to treatment. 
I've seen anecdotal reports of DSPS people who say they have su successfully shifted their schedule an hour or two earlier, but they cannot maintain a larger shift. It's also been suggested that some non-24 people could entrain to a 24-hour schedule if they did so later in the day as a DSPS person entrains, but not to a desired normal schedule. I want to touch on another misconception. When you read in the journals about circadian rhythm sleep disorders, you often read that if permitted to sleep during our body's preferred times, our sleep would be fine and we would awaken alert and refreshed. But for many of us, this is not the case. Even when we sleep on our body's preferred schedule, we may not sleep well, we may awaken often during the night, and we may feel tired and even dysfunctional in the morning. I hear this also from friends with narcolepsy and sleep apnea. The treatments do help, but these people still struggle, they still feel tired, they still need naps. It seems to be a common theme with many of these sleep disorders that even with treatment, we're still tired, we still struggle. Clearly, there's a lot we don't understand. I want to quickly mention several areas where more research is urgently needed. We mentioned several possible ca causes for these disorders. The studies of treatment done to date do not distinguish between these various causes. I would conjecture, for example, that for people who are not sensitive enough to light, very bright light in the morning may help. For those overly sensitive to light, light restriction in the evening may be more important. Without distinguishing the underlying cause, the success of a given treatment is bound to be low because it's successful only on some of the causes. We need research into the specific underlying causes and into tailoring the various treatments to the underlying cause. We also need more specific guidance on therapy parameters. What time should light be used? What time should dark therapy commence? How bright and what color should the lights be? And so forth. And we need these parameters to be determined by studying patients with these disorders and not just normal sleepers. Now, I want to mention whether light therapy can harm eyesight. In particular, there's controversy over whether bright light containing blue may contribute to macular degeneration. And many of our people worry about this. We need simpler and cheaper tests to measure the biological markers. And we need insurance coverage for these tests. We'd really love an objective measure of tiredness, a simple test that objectively measures the impairment due to poor sleep. Our estimates of how often these disorders occur are based on very limited research. Some researchers believe we greatly underestimate the prevalence. We need better surveys, which must involve careful diagnosis. People who suffer from circadian rhythm sleep disorders often seem to have other conditions as well, such as fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, depression, ADHD, etc. It has been suggested that years of sleep deprivation from trying to live on a normal schedule with a broken clock may lead to these conditions. More work needs to be done to investigate possible connections. Many people have not heard of DSPS or non-24. Our friends and families did not believe these were real disorders. Even sleep specialists often did not recognize the disorders or believe that they were easily treatable. Patients could not get accommodations at work or school. We needed an organization to raise awareness. Two years ago, we formed Circadian Rhythm, Circadian Sleep Disorders Network. 
This is our mission statement. We have a website with extensive information and links at csd-n.org. And don't forget the hyphen or you'll get the Chinese Software Development Network. We have several brochures, both printed and on our website. I'd like to close with this analogy. You wouldn't say to a blind person, my eyes can see, therefore yours must be able to see also. Similarly, you can't say, my eyes can entrain my sleep, therefore yours must be able to entrain also. Thank you, and please visit our website at csd-n.org.